Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Climbing the Ransomware Maturity Model, with Dr. Ed Amoroso and Tim Erlin. I'm Liz Fox, Marketing Events Manager at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of today's event. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. You'll notice there are several widgets at the bottom of the screen. Here you can download resources, view speaker bios, and submit questions for our Q&A section. Our speakers will remain on the line to answer questions at the conclusion of the webinar. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email today with a link to the on-demand webcast and the slides at the conclusion of the webinar. So now let's get on with the event. Take it away, Tim. Thank you, Liz, and welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, today I'm joined, with, uh, joined by Ed Amoroso, who is the CEO of Tag Cyber, uh, research professor at NYU, and the former CISO at AT&T. Um, Ed has a, a whole bunch of other accolades, but those are the, the most important, I think, for, for this forum. Uh, welcome, Ed. It's nice to see you, Tim. I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Yeah, me as well. Um, I think it's a, an important topic and certainly a timely one given the, you know, sort of the incident and threat environment that we've seen. Um, so uh, as you, you don't need to guess because it's the, the title of the, the webinar, we're, we're here to talk about ransomware. And specifically, I wanted to address this conversation towards uh, the idea that there isn't sort of one specific right way to address ransomware and think about it more in terms of a, a maturity curve that organizations can climb because not every organization is at the same place in terms of their ability or willingness or resources in order to address ransomware. Um, but before we get into that, that sort of maturity curve, I thought it would be uh, a little bit fun and also interesting uh, to start with some common myths around ransomware. Um, and Ed, I think you're in a great position to, to talk a little bit about myths that you see um, out there in the in the industry, in organizations that, that people believe that, that really aren't true about ransomware. So let's start with that, Ed. Well, for people listening, I'm guessing that a lot of you are briefing your management, your board, your supervisor, and customers, whomever. Um, and one of the first questions that gets asked is, you know, tell me about ransomware. What's the issue? What are the problems? And, um, you know, Tim and I were kind of going through our own experiences here. And there's a few things that pop up a lot that are almost implicit in the question someone might ask you about ransomware or some presumption that they have that I think you can correct. And that we'll list a, a maybe two or three of them. The first one is this idea that ransomware is this inevitable thing. Like, there's no way you can stop it. It's going to happen. Um, it's just a matter of, like... Uh, doing ransomware detection and response. I'm surprised we don't have pr uh, companies with RD, R RDR as their name, you know, ransomware detection and response. Maybe that's coming. But uh, it might be. <laughs> it might be. But I, I think it's wrong to just throw in the towel and presume that you're not going to be able to stop ransomware. There are some techniques that you can, you can use to, to prevent it, admittedly. This is a tough attack. That's the reason why there's so much attention on this, you know, including our webinar today. But hopefully as we talk today, as you listen, uh, you may come up with some ideas or some things that you'll see that maybe you hadn't thought of before that could actually be more on the shift left side of the spectrum than shift right. Tim, before I get to the other two, does that, that first one make sense to you? Yeah, and I, I think that's actually incredibly important for people to keep in mind as a as a myth because the the narrative um in the press uh and in the industry in general is this idea that that ransomware is somehow inevitable uh, yeah. because of course it, it's difficult if not impossible to report on ransomware incidents that don't occur um and ransomware you know as a as a as a, a technique has to announce itself in order to be successful it has to ask for ransom so if you're if you're writing uh, you know for the the cybersecurity industry, ransomware is a a, a great um, type of attack because it will always be discovered eventually, and that gives you something to report on. But it does create this atmosphere of of sort of inevitability, which I think I think it impacts how we as as practitioners you know choose to respond. So it's an important myth for us to to dispel. Yeah, I think so. Now the second one is probably very familiar to the people who are listening, and that's around backups. Because um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, and I know Tim has as well, 
um, a discussion, say, with a CIO or director of infrastructure or security person, where you say, what's, um, how are you guys handling ransomware? And that's usually felt with, you know, there's like this um, relaxed sigh and they say, well, we have backups. We're, we're fine. You know, if um, there's a ransomware attack, then we just push this big red button somewhere. And then, you know, you go back to the N minus one version. We're good. And maybe I lose 10 minutes of work, but we're fine. Um, in theory, that, that may be an acceptable component of a ransomware plan. There's no question that you are going to have to have some degree of resilience for your infrastructure, and that's going to include backups. But you better be careful if you assume that just doing a bunch of backups is going to be enough. Um, I mean, the simple sort of very obvious question is whether the backups become infected. So you certainly have to have some degree of separation there. Maybe more importantly, the question would be, have you ever actually done it? Did you work through it? Have you tested that? <laughs> it's a big hypothesis there that you push the red button and something actually happens. So there's a lot of problems with this idea that you can sleep at night just knowing that you've backed things up. It is an important component. You'll hear it in our discussion today. It's a theme. But it's not enough to just um, have that that, um, the, that desk drawer where you pull it out and there's a, 100 USBs all scattered around and it's all your important stuff so you're, you're safe from ransomware or you bought this thing in the cloud. Uh, Tim, uh, kind of uh, any, any comment on that one? I know that's uh, backup is such an important part of it, but not yeah. really not the, the full answer. Well, I think there, there are two things about that. First of all, th this morning uh, when I logged into Twitter, I saw a reply to uh, one of the, the tweets uh, promoting this webinar uh, where the person just said, backups, 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 keep doing it until it's automatic. So it's definitely a, a common response yeah. um, for uh, ransomware. The other, the other piece there that I think is important is a, an incident that um, I was reading about, I think just earlier this week, if not this week, last week, where the the ransomware had taken an additional step the attacker had taken an additional step not just to encrypt the data but to also um, exfiltrate it to copy it and so they were now ransoming not just access to your data but they were also essentially blackmailing the customer to yeah. not publish the sensitive data so that myth that backups are are sufficient um, i think you're right they're important but they don't address uh the threat entirely and we also have to keep in mind that as we adopt uh, responses and mitigations for ransomware, the attackers are also going to adapt to the, the changes in, in what, what they would characterize as their threat landscape. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. Yeah, that is funny. Yeah, backup, backup, backup. But it's, it's important. I mean, if you it run is. IT infrastructure, I get that. I don't need ransomware. So you might want to throw a restore in there, though. Backup, backup, restore, backup, backup, and then do that until it's automatic. Good point. Yeah. So the, the third myth, the third of three, we'll stop maybe with this third one. We get on with some uh, discussions around maturity and some other things. But the third one is, a, is a, another very common one. And this is one I heard all the time when I was back working in telecom because I was in a very large industry where we were clearly a target. There was never a question that if you're a Fortune 10 company, you know, you're a target, of course. But everyone else would always point to us and say, well, you know, you're a target. But and then that would be followed by some rationalization that because they're smaller or there's another industry or that this or that, certainly we're not a target. Why would anybody go after us? And I'll admit that there are certainly cases where a larger organization, a very large bank is going to be targeted because they're a large bank. Of course, we're, we're all that's a practical matter. But the bad news is that that's not how this works. You know, you'll you'll learn as you know in the next hour. I'm sure you probably already know that these ransomware ops campaigns, you know, a lot of them really are just out sweeping for for uh, targets or victims, you know, based on vulnerability or access or any any number of things. So it sort of doesn't matter what you think. Um, if you present yourself as a vulnerable target, you may see ransomware. As you, you could be the tiniest, most insignificant organization on the planet. And if you happen to fall into the path of some ransomware ops campaign, you're going to get hit. And, you you know, you may be sitting with your manager scratching your head saying, why would someone go after us? And I think you're ans asking the wrong question. That's almost irrelevant 
you know, whether there was some person who'd been thinking about you. If you're listening to, to Tim and I today, and there's one thing I hope you take away, if you haven't already absorbed this in the last 10 years, it's that this isn't 1985. You know, people don't go after you because they have some beef with you. <laughs> That's not how cyber security has evolved. So you have to assume that regardless of who you are, regardless of whether your board is going to demand to know why would they come after us, you have to be able to teach your executive team that that's not the way it works. Everyone's a target. Tim, Tim am I saying this right? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, you know, I like to divide it into, into sort of two categories. There are uh, you know, specifically targeted organizations or individuals. Yeah. That does happen. That does happen. But there are absolutely targets of opportunity. And yeah. so thinking of yourself as, you know, am I someone who's going to be specifically targeted or am I a target of opportunity? And when you think of it in just those two categories, you essentially eliminate the possibility that you're not a target. You're either <laughs> one of the two uh, because everybody's a target of opportunity or at some point. you could be both, right, in most cases. You certainly could be both, could yeah, be both. yeah. yeah. And that gets very interesting because if, you, if you're experiencing an incident and you're trying to determine whether it was specifically targeted or a target of opportunity, that yeah. kind of attribution is a, an interesting, if, if separate, conversation. It was so funny. Back in the 2012, when all the uh, banks were getting hit with DDoS, DDoS attacks, mm -hmm. um, yeah, attributed presumably to Iran, who knows? I think it was. It was funny, Tim. We we're trying to figure out why this bank, why not that one? Why this bank, why not that one? I don't think anybody ever figured it out. But somebody showed me. This is anecdotal correlation, but it seemed pretty interesting. We looked at the list of banks that got hit with these attacks, mm -hmm. and somebody found a donation page. I want to say the United Way or something like mm. that, some charity, and had all the banks that had given money to this organization. And I got to tell you, they lined up. And, and I thought, I will laugh and say, maybe somebody somewhere said, they said, hey, go find us a list of banks to hit. Somebody gets on the internet and pulls down this list, yeah. this donation thing. And, and I, I, again, might be just accidental, but it does go to show you that I'm sure every one of those banks went back and spent weeks or months pouring through why did they hit us and not them did we say this or do that it might have been something as silly as you just happened to give to a campaign somebody pulled the list and it was like a reverse lottery winner you got hit it's entirely possible so i think this idea of trying to overthink why somebody's coming after you sometimes it's obvious but most of my experience I've been doing this for 40 years now it's not always so easy to figure it out better to protect yourself and assume yeah. that you're a target. That seems a, a more mature way to, to handle yeah, this. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, that's a good transition for us to, to move off of the, the myths and into, into yeah. sort of that, that conversation about the, the maturity curve around addressing ransomware. Um, and, and I think we could start with sort of the, the basic level. So if we, if we take organizations that are, uh, you know, for the sake of argument, just starting on, on this journey of, addressing ransomware. What what do you expect to, to fit into that kind of basic level in terms of, maybe in terms of assumptions that that organization should make, and then in terms of the controls that, that you'd expect them to, to put in place? Well, you and I both know that the AV and backup, right? It's like, it's like this minimum sort of thing where, and, mm -hmm. and minimum, by the way, I don't mean to say, like if that's what you're doing, that that's a mistake, because sometimes that's that's perfectly acceptable, you know. And we all yeah. we all look at risk, and we decide what are we going to spend money on, and what are we not going to spend money on, and that's the that's the art. I wish I could say it was a science what we do, uh, Tim, but I I don't, I don't think it's reached that point yet. There's a there's a subjective sort of art to this of figuring out where do I kind of put my my investments? I mean, we all want to be quantitative. We want to be data-driven. We want to be risk-driven. We're moving there. But mm -hmm. there's still some subjectivity here. So for some organizations, like having a very basic response plan, maybe it's written down somewhere, maybe not, or maybe everybody knows, you know, sort of focusing on maybe detecting ransomware when it happens and being able to respond, and then arguing that, look, we do have a backup strategy our vendor tells us, because it's said on the brochure, that it, 
probably will stop, uh, you know, the backups will be clean. And our AV company, anti-malware company, you know, they tell us that they've got some signatures that, you know, like if, um, if something's going to try to encrypt all your stuff, then it sits in that service call as a shim and it stops it or, or whatever. There, mm -hmm. there could very well be some meaningful protections there. But that would seem to me to describe this minimum level. I mean, I don't want to be sort of depressing here, but I'm thinking that's 95 percent of the companies out there, maybe more, are kind of in that mode of we do AV, we got backups, we sort of know what we're doing. I think we're more or less good. Tim, does that match with your experience? Kind of that 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 sort of uh, focus at that uh, basic maturity level. I think so, and I, I like the idea of um, at this sort of basic maturity level of of, of sort of a three prong approach and keeping it simple, something that you can very easily identify, we're going to do these three things. We're going to uh, put in a backup plan, a backup system, we're going to deploy anti-malware, and we're going to develop a response plan. Um, and that way you're covering sort of a, a foundation of uh, ransomware you know, response or mitigation. It, and the backup one, and I, backups I think are, are, are important, and I do think they're that, that they fit in this basic level not just because of, of ransomware, but a good backup strategy, well implemented, um, to the point you were making earlier, it, it improves organizational resilience. Um, and it does that not just for a ransomware attack, but for any other kind of incident or outage where uh, you know the ability to, to quickly and, and effectively restore from a backup gets you back to running your business faster than, um, than the alternative of not having backups. Yeah. You know, I think you're hitting on another kind of really useful point that I hope people listening take away from this. And that's that good IT management or good infrastructure management is good security management. <laughs> Make it oh, I, absolutely. If, if the security team's saying do an X and the CIO is saying do Y, something isn't right. That, that's why I like cloud so much, because I think both the IT teams and CIOs and CISOs and everybody's feeling like virtualization and segmenting and microservices. These are all good ideas, both from a cost, usability, and security perspective. So, so when you think about the things that we're talking about here, you know, we'll get to some, you know, uh, maybe more uh, uh, advanced concepts in cyber, but all of them, if you just, if you took ransomware and you just pushed it out of the picture, you still should do all this. And I, yeah. I think that's important. Like, I hope people take that away that when you talk about that, like that's the difference between foundational controls and add-on controls. Foundational ones are ones you should always do. Don't worry about if it's this attack, that threat, or whatever. Doesn't matter because that changes every couple of years. It used to be network attacks, then with worm attacks, and DDoS, then phishing and ransomware. You travel through these types, but the foundational issues, patching, managing vulnerabilities, you better do that independent of which way the wind's blowing. The add-on stuff tends to go sort of with the whims of the, of, you know, of, of the attack du jour. So I, I do hope people recognize that as you're planning your, your strategy to protect your enterprise, focus on the foundations first. Make sure that what you're proposing is not being reactionary too much to a particular attack because who knows, maybe ransom, I don't know, maybe the ransomware all just magically stops in two years and I would imagine every single thing Tim and I are talking about here is still valid. You still mm -hmm. do it. That's well, the there, point. There's a there's a reason that that we've moved. You know, we've we've kind of moved from antivirus to anti malware. But there's a reason it's not called anti ransomware, and that's because <laughs> it addresses more than just right. ransomware. It's important to remember there are types of malware that aren't specifically ransomware. Okay. Um, and I, I always like to remind folks, although it's it's a little bit outside the the subject of this particular conversation that you know ransomware is a kind of attack that has to announce itself but if ransomware can be successful in your organization that means other types of attacks that want to stay hidden uh can also be successful yeah. and to me those are you know that's something to worry about uh, ransomware is a uh it's 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 a tough type of attack to deal with but it also is it doesn't present the problem of of um being undetectable because it always will ultimately right. ask for a ransom that's right. When ransomware is present, 
then there are vulnerabilities that could be exploited for APT and any number of other uh, mm -hmm. problems. It's an indication that vulnerabilities are present. So that's yeah. something to be attended to. So let's touch on the response plan um, side of this as well as one of the basic uh, mm -hmm. basic steps, because I think it's a it's a a, a tactic or a, a a process that that is somehow um, often ignored or it's thought of at the last minute. It's not a technical control, and so people who are who tend to be technically minded don't always think of the response plan as a foundational control, but it really is. It's it's necessary. You know what I hear, Tim, when I bring up what's your response plan? You get into all this nonsense about whether they have the ability to pay in um, cryptocurrency or not. <laughs> mm. Like, like that's the it, almost like there's this presumption that the response plan is if somebody's looking for Bitcoin, do we know how to do it? Mm -hmm. And I think, gosh, that's a pretty depressing. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't yeah. sound like a response plan to me, but I think. Way too many companies get into that kind of very uh, weirdly spiraled loop. A response plan is exactly what it's called. What, 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 that's a name that uh, is indicative of the activity. It means you've got a clearly defined step-by-step -step procedure, well understood by everybody, documented, tested, and, and, and that's designed to, to restore to, to allow you to continue on your mission. And it, admittedly, the mission could be somewhat degraded, but it's like anything. I mean, if your car is chugging along, um, there's some things that you may have to do to respond to just keep the thing going. When you change a tire, mm -hmm. you're going to drive slower, but you can still get to where you're going and you fix it later. So response plans have to be focused on the mission and all those attributes that I said earlier. At that basic level of maturity in this, my observation is it's usually not very good. Uh, and usually it's um, pretty thin. As you get to the more advanced levels, there's probably some very um, uh, some gradations in the um, in the completeness of a response plan, and definitely in whether it's tested. I would say at that basic level, I, I don't think people are actually going through quote unquote exercises to see if the response. I, I'm almost never see that. For most companies, they'll yeah, talk about yeah. it, but never, never do it. Yeah, I always like to think of the response plan as a, a way to uh, make decisions before they they have to be made. So think about what decisions you're going to have to make during the incident, um, and then make them ahead of time because that removes the possibility that you make the wrong decision during the incident when you're stressed and worried and you're not sure what's going on. Um, it it makes uh, you know. Uh, for better decision making throughout that incident, in general makes perfect sense. Yeah. So let's let's move off of this this basic level and uh, talk about sort of the the intermediate level at this point. Mm -hmm. So organization that um, has put in place a you know a backup strategy has anti malware deployed has a, a response plan. Maybe it's a little thin. Um, what do you think are the the next steps as they move up that curve, that maturity curve, in terms of of being prepared for ransomware? Well, it's hard not to think of the shift left, shift right spectrum to understand the maturity because I kind of feel like at that basic level, you're way shifted right. You're yeah. um, dealing with, you assume it's going to happen and here's what we would happen. Well, here's how we'd respond. But with the maturity sort of moving toward intermediate, I think you are getting a little more serious about managing vulnerabilities um, mm -hmm. and configurations and yeah. you know, focusing on things – even, you know, your email um, security could be an important program because, let's face it, a, a, a common vector, not the only one, not saying the only way ransomware comes in is some dummy clicks on something. Um, and you don't have to be a dummy to click on something. I've been tricked many times. But when you start to think, all right, let's go to that next level. Uh, how does our vulnerability management program help to reduce risk here? That's a little more sophisticated level of discussion then. Now, I feel like you're shifting more left. Maybe you're in the middle of the spectrum there at that um, that intermediate level of maturity. And for me, uh, configuration, managing configurations and having a good, solid vulnerability management and training program, probably very indicative of the more preventive aspect at that intermediate level. Does does that make sense, Tim? Do you I think you touched on, um, for me, a, a key realization that occurs moving from that basic to an intermediate level, which is 
the, the realization that ransomware doesn't magically appear on systems. So yeah. at that basic level, your focus is how do I detect ransomware uh, you know, on that endpoint with an anti-malware tool and how do I deal with it once it's there you know, through res restoration of backups or through a response plan. But at some point you have to realize that ransomware has to get into the environment in some way. And generally speaking, um, that's going to be through uh, you know, email, as you pointed out, through exploitation of a vulnerability through a misconfiguration that's providing for that ransomware to propagate. And so that next step from basic to intermediate, as you point out, is moving towards that uh, prevention mindset. How can I actually put in place uh, capabilities controls that um, reduce the, the potential for ransomware to get into my environment and to be successful in my environment? So yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That it, um... You know, again, our earlier comment about the foundational aspect here, that if you mm -hmm. set aside ransomware, are these still good ideas? It really sticks out here. I, I mean, you and I do a lot of these kinds of discussions around different topics. Sometimes it doesn't. Like you're talking about a very specific, I don't know, like a network security problem like DDoS. You wouldn't normally be sitting off in a network filtering pack. It's ridiculous. You're only doing because of that threat. This is totally different. This is spectacularly good housekeeping if you move up in the maturity model. And it almost feels like there's there's no better example of CIOs and CISOs working together than, you know, in dealing with ransomware. This is the ultimate opportunity for, for you to go in and clean up shop and really focus on these foundations. Like, I love your point about when you move up in the in the. Uh, maturity model here, you don't think that this just magically appears. That's how it seems to a board. Mm -hmm. I've sat on, you know, on, on, on public boards, large, large companies and banks and so on. And their perception is exactly what you said, that you're a sitting duck somehow. And it's just like this drive by thing that happens and a, and a stray ransomware bullet hits you and there's not much you could have done about it. That's the wrong mental image of what's going on here. It's not, that's not right. It, it Maybe a disease model would be a little bit more uh, mm. uh, appropriate, where you probably can avoid. Sometimes you can't, but you can take very strong steps to avoid a ransomware attack. And I think at that intermediate level of maturity, you actually recognize that, and you're trying to be a little more proactive than just running uh, anti-malware and backups. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You know, when you, as you were describing that, the first thing that came to my mind was a, a submarine for some reason. And this idea that it's, <laughs> it's under the water, you don't see it, you don't see it until it pops up somewhere yeah. where you didn't expect it. Um, and that, that idea that, that, uh, you know, it somehow got there magically and didn't have to travel, you know, ransomware has to travel. Um, but if you read, uh, you know, the, the news about ransomware incidents, they, they don't focus on, how the ransomware got in, how it got to the the sensitive data that actually is worth encrypting and, and ransoming, um, how it extracted the data. They focus more on the ransomware itself and the behavior of the organization, in part because that's interesting, but also in part because it's it's really difficult uh, to do the forensics to understand exactly what happened in a ransomware incident from start to finish. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, people who are writing uh, writing articles, news articles about it, they have deadlines and they can't wait for that forensics to. To, to happen for sure. I'm glad up you brought the submarine because it would be impossible for two security guys not to have at least one visual metaphor when we're dealing with any <laughs> kind of threat. It's almost like the law. If we didn't now that we can check the box that we've done at least one, maybe we can come up with another. But it is oh, a yeah. good that 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 image does make a lot of sense. Be beneath the surface, couldn't see it, and then boom, it hits you. I, I think that that's right. That is how a lot of people view this. And don't realize that you actually can go under the water and look and 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 get early. Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably a good uh, lead in to the advanced uh, level. Yeah, it actually. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, uh, well, we're going to talk about a, a particular control at the advanced level, and I'll, I'll come back maybe to that submarine metaphor. But at, at this intermediate level, you know, the controls that we talked about to to focus for a second on that. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about email security. I think, as yeah. you pointed out. Mm -hmm. You know the data shows that um, email is a is a primary initial vector for ransomware, and I, I say initial quite intentionally. Um, we talked about so the foundational controls, vulnerability management, um, and configuration management. So 
making sure that you've uh, you're patching vulnerabilities. You might not be able to patch all of them, but every vulnerability you patch is a reduction in your attack surface. And if you can prioritize in a meaningful way what vulnerabilities you're addressing first, you can you can focus on those that are, are likely to have the biggest impact from a prevention standpoint. And then the configuration management, focusing on um, are your your systems, are your assets configured securely? Um, do they match, for example, an industry standard like CIS or NIST? There's plenty of guidance out there for how to configure your environment securely um, that can really help um, uh, if you're not sure where to start. And that that brings us up, I think, to that that intermediate level pretty pretty clearly. Anything we missed in there, Ed? No, well, I mean, email security is an outsized issue at this point. Like it's um, maybe temporary, but right now the phishing issue has reached a crescendo. Mm -hmm. And people are complaining that their SEGs are not, you know, filtering at a, a high enough rate. Like there's too much, uh, you know, the um, stuff getting through, like things yeah. that you and I would see in our inbox and go, ah, what's this doing here? You know, I'm running a yeah. SEG and you've got this gauntlet of your SEG and, 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 the, I'm, and not to mention that every ISP already is starting by not lopping off 90 something percent of the trash that's coming at you. Most people don't realize that, that yeah. embedded in the infrastructure, there's automation that's looking at senders and seeing that if a bunch of space junk is coming from source, a source uh, XYZ, you know, uh, over some period of time, it just gets dropped. So you don't even see that. And then the stuff that passes that gauntlet hits your SAG and you've got your rules coded into that stuff that gets through. Maybe there's some backend tool that you do with crowdsourcing or, uh, vi or, or image processing or some additional type of thing. And then it gets the inbox and you've got all these training programs where you're trying to help people. And there's banners and I teach you and be careful. Even with all of that, people are still clicking. <laughs> it's it's like, still an incredibly successful vector for the attackers. It's incredible that this thing still... Because I think it's because email has become such a spectacularly pervasive tool for communication. I'd always thought 10, 15 years ago, you know, when my kids were younger, they're all, you know, out, out of college now. I thought by the time they get out of college, who the heck's going to use email again? That's so 1992, you know. But I, I was wrong. It's turned out to be a surprisingly resilient yeah. form of communication, business communication. I mean, yeah. didn't you think, remember we used to write E dash mail, like it's just like it's just <laughs> such an old thing, um, but it remains the staple of communication yeah. and it's given the attackers a, a good framework uh, for, for building um, campaigns yeah. because they understand it as well as we do. Oh, if not better. If not better. So it's, uh, so I would say that that's outsized. I don't think that's going to be forever. But I do think vulnerability management will be forever. I think that you'll always have to do, you always have to be on your guard with partners, with your service providers, with your technology providers, with your IT team, to make sure that you have a pretty good understanding on a minute by minute basis of what vulnerabilities exist that can come back to get you. It's not always just going to be this email thing. That will change, yeah. but vulnerability management, that that will, that's unfortunately not going to change. It's interesting. You know, as you say that, I, I, I'm i surprised to think about how, how little email has really changed over that 10, 15, 20-year time yeah, span. It, you true. know, there are lots of new controls and capabilities, but fundamentally, at its core, it stayed pretty static. Okay. Same thing. Which Even is, with DMARC, really well, D, D -Mark had, I, I was, when I first saw DKIM and SPF, I was, you know, very big proponent of all of that. I had a number of folks on my team contributing to the standard. And when I saw DMARC came out, I thought, this is great. And a lot of people do a lot, you know, publish DMARC records. But how many people really max out their willingness to drop based on mm -hmm. properly marked? Uh, email, it hasn't sort of reached the point where we've all jumped in at once because you have to, everybody has to do it at once. Yeah. So I've been disappointed that um, even things like um, encrypted email, yeah, um, it 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 just hasn't caught on. Like if any of the folks watching us right now wanted to send 
you, Tim, or me, an encrypted email, they'd have to do something first. I know they yeah. could figure it out, but it's not just automatic that I can encrypt an email to you. Whereas if I've got a website, admittedly, I'm off talking to a CA and setting myself up, but I can sell something to you without having interacted with you ever before. And yep. through the magic of Diffie-Hellman and, and SSL, I can sell it to you securely. Email's not at that point. We, we just have not gotten to that point. I wonder if with Google and Microsoft, um, maybe at some point we, we'll, we can sort of cajole them to, to improve matters somewhat. That's why I really do believe email will get better, but vulnerabilities will always be present. That's just, mm -hmm. It'll just shift to other things. So you got to do a vulnerability management program no matter what. All right. Well, let's let's move off of the intermediate and talk a little bit about advanced at this point. So, um, you know, moving away from the foundational controls, once you've you've sort of gotten that taken care of, you feel like you're you're good there. What do we think of uh, as advanced uh, controls or, or capabilities around ransomware? What falls into that category for you? Well, first of all, I'm supposed to be an unbiased um, analyst. But I will admit that this is a place where tripwire is pretty good. Like if you're if you're looking to get to that next level, when I read the brochures and I've sat through so many briefings from you guys, this is where you guys are pretty good. You know, we're in integrity monitoring and re really like let's start with lateral movement. That would strike mm -hmm. me as one of the first things that is pretty essential. You and I both know you said it before. I thought you said it pretty well. It's not this magic thing that happens. It's this thing. So I always think of ransomware as ransomware ops. It's not that different from APT. Mm -hmm. There are all these stages of activity. Come in through fish. You're going to gain permissions and advance your privilege. You're going to laterally move all that stuff. And, and it, a team that's at the advanced level here where you're dealing with ransomware is using the same techniques that you'd use to stop a nation state from coming at you and from traversing to stop ransomware. And that's the secret that it's not that ransomware is this thing that hits you. And I just need a V on my endpoints and we're good. When you accept that ransomware is in the same category as these more advanced operations, then you've reached that level, that advanced level, because you realize it's it's good news, bad news. Good news is you get it. The bad news is you get it. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, like uh-oh, this is a little harder than I thought. I, I see what you mean. Wow, I need to focus on detecting, look for early indicators, check. I need to make sure lateral traversal and so on is covered, check. I need to make sure I don't have any, you know, systems that are in bed. I'd start at the hardware and harden everything up and get all the vulnerabilities. Check. I did do uh, integrity monitoring of my files and infrared check. Th those are the, when you're doing that, you've got an advanced cybersecurity mm -hmm. program for your enterprise. All good stuff to do, but all things that will ultimately really reduce the ransomware risk way down from that you know, earlier basic level. Am I hitting the right things? You, you agree with the points here? I do. I think you, you touched on the, the, the lateral movement, which I think is key. The early detection, so this movement from I'm going to detect ransomware close to the point at which it's asking for the ransomware to I'm going to detect its behavior earlier yes. in its process um, and, and you know further harden my environment so that it's harder – for that ransomware to step through those those steps that it needs to take. Um, I wanted to come back to the the submarine metaphor because um, that idea of you can you can get into the water and see the submarine before it, it pops up uh, is an interesting one. It, that's to me that fits well with this idea that ransomware, you know, it enters somewhere, it's under the surface, and if you can find it while it's under the surface, you can be better prepared to respond to it. Um, and even if you can't see the submarine itself, what you can, it, it can't move through the water without displacing some of it, without creating a um, a wake and movement, and that's where I see change detection and integrity monitoring as being yeah. valuable, um, especially at that advanced level. Because whatever that ransomware is doing, it's got to make an impact in terms of changing something in your environment, whether it's a file that shows up on a system, whether it's a privilege, privilege escalation, um, you know, a, event that occurs those are changes that occur in the environment. And if you're monitoring for those changes, certainly maybe not the first thing you want to implement, you know, put the anti-malware in place first, uh, you know, pardon the configurations first, 
but then start watching the environment for those changes that indicate there's something going on. Um, and if you can do that, I think you've you've certainly moved up to that that advanced level in terms of of uh, malware response and malware mitigation. I mean, change detection is a great phrase. It's something anyone can understand. The keywords or buzzwords that one should be watching for from vendors would be things like behavioral analytics or mm. profile based monitoring. These are like the the marketing designations that people would put on their product. It's funny, I, and you you're an expert at this. I, I don't think I can remember too many companies writing change detection, but it seems like they should. That's a simpler way. I Like I get it immediately versus, you know, advanced heuristic behavioral activity monitoring based on profiles. Like, all right, I got to get it written by a computer scientist. But change detection is, in fact, the thing you're looking for. And then I want confirmation that the change is valid. Like, mm -hmm. and that's where, that's right. you know, that's where the intelligence comes in. I don't think machine learning has gotten to the point where it surpasses basic behavioral profiling. I mm -hmm. think behavioral analytics today, 2021, are still the best way to detect change. But ML is getting there. And and I think eventually the two will work together. But right now, I, agree. I think with uh, profile-based profile uh, tools seem well, to work uh, well there. I think there are, there are certain certainly simple steps you can take before you get to ML that are, are possibly more effective in most environments. Things like, you know, can you, can you identify changes that occur outside of a change window? If you've gone to the trouble of putting in place a change window, you know, the changes that occur outside of that window are, are worth investigating. Um, can you match changes back to a, a change request ticket? Again, if you've put in place the rigor to create a workflow around changes, um, identifying the changes that aren't tied to that workflow is a good indicator that something is going on, whether it's ransomware or something else, that warrants some investigation. Um, yes. And putting in place a process to do that ultimately reduces unplanned change in your environment. And unplanned change is a, is a key uh, you know, cause for outages in general, whether security or not. So there's certainly benefit there. You know, a little pet peeve that I'll share, and, and, and I think at Tripwire, you guys do this well, but some companies don't, where they'll talk about machine learning or behavioral analytics or some algorithm, and when a CISO asks for an explanation of how it works, I hope that people listening will absorb this, you should be able to understand how they describe They should be able to put it in terms that can make sense to you. If they start lobbing a bunch of math terms and nonsense, and you're talking to a, a I, I'm an academic, I, 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 they're throwing all that math stuff at you, then that means they don't understand it. They should be able to describe it to you in a way using, you know, a, it could even be another one of these metaphors, but, um, but demand that if they say, I'm using machine learning to do such and such, then they should be able to say something simple like, well, when you make a change, we look at different attributes, and we built a model that shows that if the ratio of this to that looks a lot of whack, a lot of times that change is no good, and and that way it'd be outside the model, and we'd flag it. Like they should be able to describe these mm -hmm. things to you simply. If they can't, I'd I'd run for the hills. I think uh, when a vendor can't describe their technology, that is a problem. That's it. again, Tim. It's one of the things I've liked about working with you guys. Yeah, I've always felt like um, Tripwire is an iconic company. You guys have been at this a long time. But it's one of the strengths of the firm. You guys have always been good at explaining, certainly to me and to customers, what the dickens you're doing. And that's why I think you guys have had some success. So I hope that's um, advice that people will take to heart. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Ed, I think we, we covered the basic, the intermediate, the advanced. Um, I'm going to give folks a chance to enter questions into the, the Q&A uh, yes. box if they'd like to do so. And I'm going to take the time to spend uh, two short slides talking about uh, Tripwire and ransomware. Um, yeah. And then we'll come back to those questions, take a look at what's in there, and see if we can we can answer uh, some or all of them in the time that we've got left. Good. I'm looking forward to seeing what you've got here. So when we talk about ransomware and Tripwire in particular, I, I wanted to, to lay out this, um, you know, sort of, pre-compromise and post-compromise perspective, um, which I think ties well to the, the conversation we just had. Um, when you're looking at what you can do prior to a compromise occurring, prior to that ransomware, um, you have capabilities like asset discovery, uh, security configuration assessment, vulnerability management, really those preventative controls that ensure that you know what's in your environment, uh, that it's configured as securely as you would like it to be, um, as securely as possible, if that's uh, relevant. 
uh, and that you're managing the vulnerabilities. And that, that really lowers or reduces that attack surface. Uh, and then there are a number of technologies uh, and capabilities that Tripwire can provide that, that work at the point of compromise. Um, so we talked about integrity monitoring uh, as a way to detect uh, ransomware in your environment, making lateral movement, um, identifying those uh, those changes that occur. So we'll put integrity monitoring and change detection in that that sort of uh, detection category. Uh, Tripwire also provides uh, policy content around the MITRE attack framework, which specifically looks for tools, techniques, and procedures that may indicate a compromise in your environment. And that's part of what we offer as well. And then finally, uh, Tripwire has this capability to uh, integrate with uh, sandboxing tools for file execution analysis. So a common workflow in Tripwire is to detect a new file that's shown up in your environment. The next step is to find out what that file is. We can hand that off to a sandboxing tool like Palo Alto Wildfire, Cisco Threat Grid, those kinds of tools, um, have it executed and return that file analysis back into, into Tripwire products so that you've automated that workflow um, around identifying how new files behave in your environment. And then as we move to the post-compromise piece, um, change detection fits in there as well. Um, you may uh, need to do the forensics to understand what happened in the environment. Um, so identifying the changes that occurred is a, is a powerful forensics tool. Um, sometimes log data, often log data only gets you so far, um, but that detailed change data, who made the change, uh, and the business context around that change is key for forensics. And then finally, log analysis is part of Tripwire's portfolio as well. Um, and log data, uh, I wish I could remember the exact quote. Um, I think it was from uh, Anton Chuvakin as a Gartner analysis said um, something like, you, you, you can't possibly do incident response without logs. Um, and it's really a, a basic control to have. And of course, we deliver those capabilities uh, through a set of products. So this is our product portfolio slide. Um, and uh, you know we can spend a lot of time talking about each of them, but we won't spend it here. Um, through the middle, you've got the basic capabilities that each product provides. Uh, Tripwire Enterprise is kind of our flagship product. Um, we do have a, a an extensive um, industrial cybersecurity arm uh, in partnership with our parent company, Belden. Uh, and we're also introducing a, a series of um, software as a service offerings like Configuration Manager and Tripwire for DevOps that are targeted more at containers and clouds, uh, cloud assets, cloud accounts um, as well. And with that, I'll flip to the uh, picture slide, if you will, and take a look at the Q&A and see what we've got in here in terms of questions. Uh, all right, and you can continue entering questions if you'd like. Um, so one question here, uh, will banning cryptocurrency or cryptocurrency transactions curb ransomware? Interested to hear Ed's thoughts uh, specifically, actually, from this. Of, this, uh, of course, of course not. I mean, it's that that's, um... That that's not the right way to to even think about the problem. Like I understand where you're coming from with the question, because I see all the articles as well, and have had all the discussions with lawmakers in Washington and policymakers where the this idea that um, tracing the money is going to be the way to do this. That's um, that that doesn't strike me as the right approach here. I I like the more foundational approach of let's clean up our infrastructure, let's look for these attacks. There's so many good reasons to do that beyond ransomware that um, this idea that I'll, I'll take some financial view um, to figure out who's doing this seems silly. There's way too many countries and way too many actors that can do this with complete and total impunity where you can't get them. That just doesn't seem to me to be a, a valid strategy. I'm not against, by the way, uh, the FBI, Secret Service, and others, law enforcement, doing that. I'm for that. I'm just saying that for all of us, you know, dealing with the day-to-day -day problems of enterprise, the, the the equivalent here is Tim and I saying essentially, don't smoke, cut down on your drinking, eat better, get some exercise, you know, get a little rest. I mean, those are all excellent things to do, and um, that's why I think. Um, it makes sense to, to use ransomware if, if necessary as an excuse if you're having trouble getting budget to clean up some of these foundational issues. So that, that would be my view on that. I'll, I'll ask a follow-on question there that, that's come up in some other conversations I've had and get your thoughts on it. And what about um, making paying the ransom illegal? Like 
legislating that it's illegal to pay ransom. Do you think that's a, an approach that that is effective? Not if you're running a children's hospital and you need to turn the ventilators on in the next 20 minutes. Um, that doesn't sound like a, a sound or even an enforceable strategy. What are you going to do? You're going to go sue the children's hospital afterwards, you know, go haul them into the paddy wagon somewhere. That's not going to happen. Um, I think it's a bad approach. I'd much rather if you want to legislate something, legislate that some people have to have good cybersecurity programs. And I understand that that's what NIST and others try to do. And I, I've been vocal in my criticisms of how some of that is being done. But um, sadly, I, I, I think that it barks up the wrong tree when we focus too much on the payment aspect here and not enough on the basic computer network and information security um, tools mm -hmm. and strategies. That's the place to do it. That's the correct place. You do that and you got the right approach. Let the yeah, let law enforcement worry about chasing criminals and so on with uh, cryptocurrency payments. But um, I I don't know Tim what you think, but I you can think of too many scenarios where that would be a very uncomfortable law. Well, it, it it buys into the myth that that ransomware is is inevitable as well. That that idea that you should wait until the ransomware has been successful to do something about it. Um, wait until that end of the the continuum, if you will. So I tend to yeah. agree with you. I mean, yeah. generally, you'd like to not have to pay a ransom. Like when you're involved in one of these things, and I've sat on boards where it's been an issue and it's come up, and you start with the presumption that, well, let's try and deal with this. Uh, sometimes you can't. And then what are you supposed to do? You know, mm -hmm. And experience dictates that because the ransoms are usually very reasonable and and much of the empirical evidence is that it's often not a repeat systemic issue where you pay and then boom, you're hit again, that the temptation is just too great for a lot of organizations to do it. And I, I would always say, if you feel like you need to do it, your children's hospital, you need to turn on the ventilators. Well, if you're going to do it, use that as day zero, meaning, okay, this will never happen again. And that now we are going to get ourselves to an advanced level of prevention and de early detection and lateral movement security, all the things we talked about, should be talking to Tripwire. Um, then, I, then at least something bad turns into something good, you know, if you, if you feel so inclined. The best of all, if you don't have to pay and you've already taken the steps and you can recover, but I think you have to leave that option open in cases where the risk assessment would just dictate that you're better off doing it. And I know there's a lot of people here would say, pay under no circumstances. You know, I, I maybe, um, but I think that there are circumstances where um, there really no other option. Well, if you're gonna take that approach of pay under no circumstances, I think you, you, you better have a response plan that deals with that. That's right. like that, that requires a response plan to say, here's what we do for every possible scenario that doesn't involve payment because we're never going to pay. Uh, That's right. That's yeah. right. This is not like you're dealing with, you know, terrorists and airplanes and things. This is different. You know, this is a different kind of thing. And uh, there are ways to avoid it. So, no. um, Okay. So another question here. Uh, do you have a recommendation for a, a means or a product to render your backups immutable? Uh, not a, not an area of expertise for me, but uh, maybe you have something to say about it. Ed. Well, I'm not going to say product. I, that that seems um, inappropriate to get on and talk about specific problems. But here's what I would recommend. When you are talking to your infrastructure providers, because a lot of this might be cloud storage providers, it may be cybersecurity vendors that have a tool that purports to do backup. When you do, you can and should engage in the discussion with their team around how they will take you through the scenarios and show how the controls are in place to prevent ransomware attacks from inv invading, infecting, or degrading the whole purpose of the backup. You should go through that. There are vendors that will take you through that. You all know how to do that. I'm, I'm, again, I'm an analyst, and we do help companies. You come to tagcyber.com, happy to help you with that engagement. But the discussion with the vendor needs to be something that you can resonate with, where they show you. Listen for the controls. Test 
the scenarios, try and understand from a technical perspective how they've built functionality that creates that separation, because those are the words you want to hear, control and separation, isolation, that's the essence of this. It's like I got a bowl of water over here and a bowl of water over there, and one little drop of ink that gets into either one is you're not going to have clear water anymore. It's how do I keep my water clear of this infected ink that's bouncing around? So the isolation controls have to be really strict and carefully enforced. And it's not easy, but there are vendors who do it. So go out and check. Yeah. It's not a big deal to go out and get a, a short list of companies that uh, you're probably already dealing with. We're more that's than happy to explain it. It's an interesting topic the way you describe it there because I, I so I spend you know some of my time on the, the enterprise IT security side and some of my time on the industrial cybersecurity side, and uh, there are certainly vendors and tools on the industrial side that have invested a lot more and spent a lot more time working on this this kind of uh, you know um, it, separation, true separation, true one way communication. Uh, there's a tool. Uh, you know, called the data diode um, well, that exists on the industrial side. Would yeah, be, unidirectional. It would be the more common term. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you don't you don't see that on the enterprise IT side as much, but it, it might be that there's some there's some lessons to be learned there for how um, organizations segment environments like nuclear power plants. Um, yeah, OT where co companies it has buy these unidirectionals. You're right. That's yeah. an excellent point. That that's a um, that would not be the type of firm typically that would come to mind when you're thinking about ransomware. But the way unidirectional gateways work is literally a laser <laughs> you know, yeah. embedded in, in some uh, hunk of gear. And you can argue that you know the, the TX and RX uh, is only going to go one direction. And you yeah. fake the servers on either side and you just keep them updated through the unidirectional. It's things like that. That's an example of a control. So, you know, finding someone who can help you with unidirectional may be part of it. Um, you, you really do need to engage in discussions with your backup and storage vendors and listen for the controls because many of them, they, they're no dummies, right, Tim? They, they, they know that we're holding webinars on ransomware and mentioning backups. So when you're a product manager in that area, you're all over this. This is mm -hmm. job one to convince companies that you can be helpful with ransomware. So you'll have no problem coming up with 10, 10 uh, product teams that'll show up in your conference room and lay out their approach. But it's up to you, the buyer, again, with help from analysts and others, to try and figure out which ones make sense and which ones are just maybe a little bit of PowerPoint magic. <laughs> so yeah. that's where the industry is right now, that transition from idea to reality. So we've we've gotten to the point where I think I have to pick and choose from the questions that are up here, and I've got one that I think is a, a good one for us to close out on, and, and it's interesting. Um, in, in the in the IT security space, there is this uh, I'll call it a problem that the the best way to get an organization to invest in cybersecurity is for them to experience a breach, to experience an incident. And do you have any advice on how to get the business executives? to invest in cybersecurity before that breach occurs? No. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, it was a terrible question. <laughs> I have been trying my whole career to do that. It's a great question. Look, you don't take your sneakers off before you get on a train, right? You do before you get on an airplane. Why, why don't you before you get on a train? Because 9-11 involved airplanes, not trains. If 9-11 was a bunch of trains, then you wouldn't be able to do that. I mean, I think the most conductors at most stations would help you carry a bomb onto a typical train. So I'm just saying, unfortunately, maybe it's in something related to human beings, but we tend to get religion when there's a problem. Uh, show me a vegan, and I'll show you somebody who's probably had a heart scare at some point in his or her career. So generally, that is a problem we've lived with for 30 or 40 years. It is a good topic to close on because I would go out and charge everyone listening. That is the central issue here. We shouldn't be waiting. That was when we went basic, intermediate to, to mature, Tim. We said basic is you sit back and wait. Mature is you're a vegan not because you had a heart scare, but because you know it's healthy. I mean, that's the challenge we all have here. So 
that uh, maybe helps to define what we all do for for a living every day well, to you try know, and to move more people in that direction. And just like vegans, uh, folks in IT security can't help talking about it all the time. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah. All right. The bad part of vegans, right? The good mm -hmm. part is healthy. <laughs> I want to thank you, Ed Amoroso, for spending time with us. I think it was a great conversation, very interesting, um, and I appreciate your time. And I hope everybody uh, uh, found it uh, useful and educational, uh, and uh, this will be recorded. I'll hand it over to Liz uh, to close us out just briefly as well. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thank you, Ed and Tim, again, for a great event, and thank you to our audience for attending. Again, like Tim said, we hope you found this session informative and useful to you. I know we had a few people that joined late or had to leave early, um, so we'll make sure that everyone receives a link to the recording later today. Uh, if you'd also like to receive proof of attendance, please make sure to respond to that follow-up email. So thank you all again, and hope you have a great day.